கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா கருணார்ணவமாய் கருதக்கதி நல்கும் அருணாச்சல சிவம் ஈதா Namaste and welcome to another episode of Ananya Bhakti. Ananya Bhakti is a little bit different from what we ordinarily understand as bhakti because Ananya Bhakti is done or conceived of in the context of Advaita. And Advaita philosophy, we see no difference between the self and the world and God. and all that because they're all simply part of the one brahman so i've gotten over the giddy stage <laughs> of my latest realization so i'm going to try to settle down and do another episode here let's see if i can stick to the script <laughs> today we're going to talk about ishwara the controller Ishwara or God is simply our own infinite power of self-love. When reflected in the limited mind, he seems to us to be another. When we walk the spiritual path leading to surrender and self-realization, that illusion is vanquished and we see reality as it is. So in ordinary religion and conventional bhakti we conceive of god ishwar the controller as a separate being a different identity a supreme self like the soul of the universe but in ananya bhakti we don't conceive of him as separate we conceive of god as a reflection in our limited mind of the omnipotence of the self the real self is not only omnipotent but eternal unlimited all knowing uh, without any boundaries so there are, aren't any separate individuals consciousness in one individual is indistinguishable from consciousness in another because it's simply a pure mirror that reflects everything in an undistorted way so the same is true of god god is simply the part of our self that we deny because we want to see ourselves as an individual who can own things who can do things who can experience things separately from a unique point of view and so it is but that's just a dream and when that dream is over then we realize who we really are and that doesn't mean that we go around creating galaxies and destroying universes <laughs> In other words we don't become Ishwara that's a myth to think that one becomes god upon self realization is simply not true what actually happens is that the limited self the ego the mind the world god and all other so called individuals disappear and one is only aware of the self the one the one and only so this self is the origin of everything when we see it reflected in the mind though it appears to be many so that's the illusion and that's what we overcome through practice of ananya bhakti to know god is to love god therefore the path of bhakti 
and of jnana are the same. The thought of God is divine favor, is by nature prasad or arul. It is by God's grace that you think of God. This is a lovely quote from Ramana Maharshi. To know God is to love God because God is love. And what does God love? <laughs> God loves the self and the self is all. So God is all loving by nature. Try to understand. He's not an angry old man of the bolt of lightning getting ready to send everybody to hell forever and ever. Where did that come from? Some twisted mind, I guess. No, God is everything and is the substance of everything. The root substance, Brahman, of which everything is made. So all the avatars, all the incarnations, all the demigods, all the devas, all the individual living entities, huh? the jiva shaktis, the shivas, the, the brahmas, the vishnus, and all the devas are all part of God. That's all. It's just that we are looking into a broken mirror. The mind, which is dividing everything into individuals. So we see all these things as separate, but actually they're one. It's just like if we go up on the hill here, we see many, many rocks, huh? rocks, trees, dirt, dust, bushes, so many things, huh? individual things. But if we go farther away and back off and look from a distance, what do we see? We see one hill. So it's like that with God. If we get all caught up in the details of the various manifestations, yes, then we see many different individuals. But if we back off and see everything in one vision, then it's one, it's the self. And that is the secret of self-realization. That is prasad, God's mercy, or arul in Tamil. So by God's grace, we get to think of God. And what is God's grace? His love. Uh, grace, the, the word that's usually translated grace in Ramana's teaching, is uh, karuna, compassion. Uh, karunar navamaik. <laughs> he is an ocean of compassion, unlimited source of compassion. Why? Because from God's point of view, everything is beautiful. Everything is right. Everything is just and perfect. There is no imperfection. What's not to love? So God is love. Take the case of bhakti. I approach Ishwara and pray to be absorbed in him. I then surrender myself in faith and by concentration. What remains afterwards? In the place of the original I, perfect self-surrender leaves a residuum of God in which the I is lost. This is the highest form of parabhakti, supreme bhakti, prakti, surrender, or the height of vairagya, renunciation. So here's Ramana again instructing us that Although we perceive Ishwara or God as separate from ourselves, in bhakti we come to him and pray to be absorbed in him, to lose the small, imperfect, individual I in the great and perfect communal I, I am, I, I, uh, the absolute consciousness. This is the same thing that Buddha taught in his teaching of Nirvana, 
but he was teaching using negative logic. This teaching uses the positive logic, which is that only God, only Brahman is real. Everything else is an illusion uh, caused by the imperfection of the individual mind. But once we come to see things in the uh, consciousness of the self, then everything is perfect because it's complete. There's nothing left out. Uh, the complete means that we see the perfection underlying the manifestation. The manifestation in its different pieces may not be perfect in itself. But when we put all those pieces together and see the whole, then it's indeed completely perfect. So after surrender by concentration on the self, self-realization occurs. And after that, there's no more individual I. The ego disappears, becomes melted, merged in the great I, the Brahman. So there is a residuum left. It's not that one simply drops the body and disappears. No, the body remains. But who's living there? <laughs> not the same I, not the individual I, but actually now the self is living in that body. Of course, the self was always there. The self was always living in that body. But we were in denial of the self. So we wanted to see the body as an expression of a unique individual. Actually, it is. But the unique individual happens to be the self, Brahman, the all. <laughs> so everything God does is perfect. That doesn't mean that the individual is perfect, but that the whole is perfect. And that's the ultimate conclusion of bhakti, vairagya, renunciation, where one gives up striving as an individual I and merges into the greater whole. Being completely absorbed in self-abidance, giving not even the slightest room to the rising of any thought other than self-contemplation, is giving oneself to God. Even though we place whatever amount of burden upon God, that entire amount he will bear. One Parameshwara Shakti, supreme power of God, is driving all activities, causing and controlling everything that happens in this world. So then what is the need for individual striving? Therefore, the key to self-realization is self-abidance, simply concentrating on the self and abiding in the self and not allowing any individual thoughts or thoughts of individual identity to arise. So this is giving oneself to God. This is prapti, surrender. Okay, it's not that surrender means that we allow the guru to make us do anything he wants or that we uh, have to sacrifice our firstborn son <laughs> like it's given in the Bible. No, that's all symbolic. What it really means is that we have to give up our sense of being an individual I and allow the self of all to enter into us. And because he's the doer anyway, we're not the doer, huh? Do you really think? <laughs> it's not possible because everything that happens in this body is actually preordained and foreknown by God. So all these things are going on and we're taking credit for it, but it's a lie. This whole world is a lie. And the lie is, I am separate from God. 
Why should we always think it is necessary for me to act in this way? It is necessary for me to act in that way. Instead of being calm, peaceful, and happy, having yielded to that supreme controlling power. Though we know that the train is carrying all the burdens, why should we who travel in it suffer by carrying our small luggage on our head instead of leaving it placed on the train? He's giving a nice example that when we're walking to the train station, we have to carry our luggage and it's a burden. But once we come actually onto the train, we can put that luggage down. We can put it on the luggage rack under the seat <laughs> or wherever and forget about it. We don't have to bear it anymore. So similarly, someone who comes to surrender to God can put all his burdens, all his cares, all the stuff that he's carrying with him, all of his luggage onto God. Huh? Please take this burden. Take my worries, take my pains, my pleasures, my cares, my good qualities and my bad qualities. Huh? My destiny, my karma, my fate, my possessions, my tiny body, <laughs> my tiny mind. <laughs> take it all. Because why? He is already bearing all these burdens. He is already causing all these activities. He is already the root cause and the substance of all manifestations. So actually, it's simply recognizing the reality. Uh-oh, I'm getting giddy again. <laughs> We're thinking all these beautiful thoughts. Who wouldn't? And this is the supreme pleasure. This is the ecstasy of devotion, uh, the nectar, amrit, the uh, deathless pleasure of immortality that one uh, realizes when surrendering to God. Everything that happens in our life, both externally as a body living in this material world and internally as a thinking and feeling mind, happens only by the will of God, that is, by the love that he has for us as his own self. Since he is all-knowing, nothing can happen without him knowing it. So the vision of the Western philosophers that God created the universe, wound up the clockwork of nature, and then went away, huh? leaving us to our own devices. This is a terrible, bad joke. Don't go for it. Uh, don't accept it. It's, it's really destructive, you know, because actually the reality is God cares for us by his love. That doesn't mean he's going to coddle our ego and give us everything we desire. No because that might not be good for us. In fact, it almost certainly wouldn't be good for us. So he doesn't give all that we desire to aggrandize our egos. Instead, he gives us the experiences we need to drive us toward self-realization. The goad of suffering is what makes us finally do something about it. When we finally hit bottom, we can't stand it anymore. <laughs> we can't take it anymore. That's it. Okay, I'm going to surrender to God. And then something can really happen. So actually, by making suffering happen in the world, God's doing us a favor. He's giving us a blessing. This is his kindness. This is his love. Because... In that way, we are constantly reminded that our knowledge is imperfect, that our actions are wrong because they lead to suffering, that our existence as an individual is illusory, and that real pleasure, real knowledge, and real existence, immortality, 
is there in surrender to the self. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum. Karunar Navamai Karudakadinal Gum Aruna Chalashivam Yidam